Hello there. Today we're going to look at context maps. My name is Wedera from Kodarasa. What are context maps? They are the integration of the different bounded contexts. The simplest way to represent it is using a diagram indicating mapping between the different bounded contexts. We're going to look at an example of this sometime later. The bounded contexts need names for easy reference and the team members do need to know where the boundaries lie. So let's look at examples using the school management system, of course. We have a student bounded context and they have a relationship here to the teacher bounded context. Another example here, we're seeing that they also have a relationship to the class bounded context. They also have a relationship to activities bounded context. And lastly, not you could have as many as you want, of course. We also have a relationship to the class routine bounded context. You can have different ones, name them whatever, according to your system, according to how you've decided to section everything in your system. Let's look at creating a context map. What do we need to know? We need to capture the current state as is and not the assumed future. It's easy to try and get this perceived notion of where we should be, so we try to create exactly that, but don't fall for that trap. Try as much as possible to work with what you have as is. Form an understanding of where you are so that you're better able to determine where you're heading. You're better able to build for what you currently have, you know. And lastly, if the layout changes, which that will happen, you'll find you had named your bounded context some ways or you had devised your major domain into different ways and then you find out you, that doesn't really work out for you you may end up maybe merging some bounded context into one you may end up splitting them in different ways so these changes will happen and all you have to do is make sure you update them accordingly let's look at an example in a real world we have many countries having 80 kilometers per hour as their speed limit for most of their highways for most of their roads this you can say is a way where they have a similar system where all these different countries have a similar way of working together. So in this case, they are sort of sharing uh, this pattern. They like in the, in this, in this case, you'd say they are working in a similar way. You also have a difference, for instance, when it comes still to <laughs> traffic where some countries have to keep left and in some countries when you're there you have to switch and you have to keep right. This is something that happens in the real world but we'll see that we can have that in our system. There will be different ubiquitous languages in the various bounded contexts. Remember all of these have their own language, they have their own model, they have all like they're all representing different models, different data, different databases, everything that is usually contained within a bounded context, and they will be different from what you have. So that's something to be really aware of so that you don't spill your bounded context into another, so that you also don't have it spill. You also want to keep this very clear boundary. Either way, we will need to relate to them in one way or another. For instances where you have you will be needing data from a different bounded context you will be supplying data to a different one so we need to associate so what are some ways we can do these integrations effectively let's look at types of integrations in domain driven designs when doing context mapping we can do so by working together we'll see different examples where we sort of work together and in different degrees of it we also have a system where technically you're still sort of working together, but it's with an external system, it is with a legacy system, especially systems you don't really have much control over or you don't have the time to even modify such a system. So you end up creating sort of a, a layer to ensure that you only get what you need from that system and nothing more from the other system, of course, so that... You know, you don't have them spilling things that you don't need in your system. And last but not least, sometimes you just end up not working together. It's not practical, so the only solution is finding ways to work with what you currently have. We'll look at context mapping. Our first example will be shared kernel. And this is where you designate some subset of the domain model that the two teams or many other multiple teams can now share. We'll look into more details on this, but ideally 
this set is maintained by both teams. They are in charge of keeping it up to date. They're in charge of sharing it. You can't be changing information that is shared anyhow. You have to have a consensus on how to go about sharing information, changing that information if need be. So maybe have meetings to do that. That's one way of context mapping. The other one is customer supplier relationship. This is typically an upstream downstream where there's a, a team upstream that is feeding information to another one downstream. Ideally, one system is feeding into another. So this also has its issues here and there and it also of course is effective but one of some issues you can find with this type of system is that the upstream may feel inhibited every time they need to make changes because they're afraid of breaking things downstream and also of course the downstream may also feel like they are the mercy of the upstream team so this is one dynamic that could go wrong with such a system but of course, there are ways to ensure that it is done effectively. Let's look at our third way of doing context mapping domain-driven design, which would be conformist. In conformists, you still need this team. They are not so willing to work with you, or rather, they don't have the time to make changes for you. They're not even willing. It's not, I mean, it's not my KPI. It's not, it's not part of my job description. Why should I care about your needs? Yet you still need them. So what do you do in this case? You just follow what you're given. Follow the leader. I give you this, just work with it as is. If I make changes, it is your job as the team feeding from me to now ensure that you make changes on your end so that my changes don't break your current system. So that's one way. It's actually not used a lot because people fear it, but it can be very effective because the reality is most of the models are not changed as often as we do think. And even when that is done, the protocol nowadays is to actually inform people beforehand so that they, or at least even have some sort of backward compatibility so you will have time to make your changes. So it is actually a very practical way to follow, although people still fear it. But if it comes to it, I would recommend using conformist as one way. The fourth method we're going to look at is separate ways. Here, we've tried to work together. It is impossible. Of course, different factors will determine how effective integration will be or what mode of integration we'll be using. We'll look at some of the factors that determine this. But when it comes to separate ways, you've tried integration, it's not working, so you just end up having to seek solutions within what you currently have. Our next context mapping method would be anti-corruption layer. This is a layer to provide clients with functionality in terms of their own domain model. Ideally, you want a solution where you only get what you are seeking because then you expose yourself to much more corruption in terms of getting data you don't need. What you do is have a layer between your external system, your legacy system, the one you're trying to get information from, between that and your system, it can be bidirectional, so, so that's something to be aware of. But... Ideally, it's there to protect your system from now corruption from the other side. Of course, the other system can also do the same. But again, it's a layer to protect you to only ensure that you get only information you need for your own domain model and not anything more. Of course, not anything less. And lastly, technically not lastly, but they are tied together in a way, but we will see how this is the case, uh, especially when we go into more detail when it comes to open or services, is open or services. This is a protocol that gives access to your system as a set of services. How do you come to using such a system? So you are a system that is really, like many people need information from you. So instead of maybe trying to adjust where I, every get to each one every one of these people's needs you can try to create an open sort of an open platform where you publicize the data the model you're willing to publicize in a way that many people can now consume so if for instance many people will need to use my api i can now 
publicize it in a way that now many people can now easily come and interact with it, get the information they need, but specifically what I am willing to share, of course. So if maybe you have a different relationship with a different system where you're maybe willing to share more than that can be a different relationship. But in this situation, it's more of a public way you're trying, not necessarily public, but you're trying to publicize it to many different people and not just a few people where you can maybe have a custom relationship with. But this one is more of a general setup, unlike the other ones, which were mostly sort of interpersonal in a sense. Like there was that maybe tight knit relationship involved. And type to it is published language. This is a common language for the translation. So this goes hand in hand with open of services because when you're going to publicize this let's say API for many people to use, you need to use a language that many people understand. Let's say I'm going to use XML uh, for many people you saw, especially enterprise system. I, again, according to who you're targeting, if you're going to have web services, you may rely on using JSON. If you're using wire format, you can use Avro, you can use Protobuf. Again, depending on who you're targeting, who they're mostly, like what they're mostly using, it's best to now create it in a language that is easily consumed by them, that is easily understood by your end clients. Let's look at factors determining the associations. Of course, there will be different cases. Why would pick one over the other? Why would I go for anti-corruption layer? At what point do I go for customer supplier? So how do we determine which one to pick, when to pick it? For one, the level of control you have over the other model does influence you a lot. I'm going to maybe rely on conformist when I don't really have control over your model. What I end up with is just working with what you give me. But if I have more control over your model, I may end up using something like customer supplier where I can now influence how your model progresses or I have more know-how before you make those changes. Like some such a scenario, having that control over the other model helps you pick a better context mapping according to the specific situation you're in. Another factor would be the level and type of cooperation between teams for instance, you can't have shared kernel with teams that you don't easily work with. The managers are even far apart where they don't even have a common manager or they're not, they're very different departments. Then it would be very, very tricky for you to share a model together, share that. It would be tricky to even cooperate and work with other systems. Even customer supplier relationship can be tricky in that sense because you're not easily meeting each other. Anyway, knowing that, then it will influence what type of context mapping you're going to go with. And lastly, the degree of integration of features and data. So let's look at a scenario where you have these two or three teams or whatever, they have the same way of doing things operation-wise. They have the same time they do stand-ups or at least similar predictable times. They have the similar software development processes, even around sprint planning or whatever. Then you may find it easier to work with this other team because you can easily blend to how they do things than if they really have a very varied way of doing things. Then it may be an issue when it comes to working together. So that is one way of looking at it. If if they have, for instance, if they, need the, if, they, if they arrange their data in a chaotic way, according to, like in a very different way from the way you have, then it may even be an issue where you're trying to learn how the other team is working so that you can work with them. See, all these things may be a big issue when you're trying to work together. Languages can be an issue, the type of technologies. Maybe one is using Kubernetes, the other one is using Rancher. Then there's all this learning to try and work together, especially if maybe I have to interact with your code base a lot. Of course, if you don't have to interact with the other person's code base, then it doesn't really matter in that case. But again, it's still a big factor when you're trying to work with each other. Let's look at this illustration of context map from the Blue Book by Eric Evans. A bounded context assesses or overview relationships with a context map. Bounded context keep the model unified using continuous integration. Bounded context names enter ubiquitous language. 
of course, everything in that bounded context around the model, around tactical, strategic design, everything should go to the ubiquitous language, anything explaining it, of course. You have no business putting things that don't belong to it. Context map overlap a lead context through shared kernel. Context map relate a lead context as customer supplier teams. Context map overlap unilaterally as conformist. Context map support multiple clients through open or service and they formalize that as a published language using published language context map free teams to go separate ways and lastly context map translate and insulate unilaterally with anti-corruption layer some tip for this ensure contact points with other bounded contexts are very thoroughly tested because this will help you easily capture problems when you depend on other models that you do not control and that's it on context mapping in domain-driven design. I am Oidera from Kodarasa. Bye.